Hi, and welcome to module 5, the last module of lecture 14. In this module, we're going to cover the concepts of concavity and convexity in more than one dimension. Now, if you think back to part 2 of the class, we first introduced the concepts of concavity and convexity in the context of calculus in a single variable. And to remind you all what these things are, in a single variable, a concave function, a concave increasing function, there are similar definitions for decreasing functions, but a concave increasing function looks kind of like this, and its major property, um, intuitively, is that any secant you draw between any two points on the curve will lie below the curve itself. If it always lies strictly below the curve, we have a strictly concave, fu concave function. If it lies, um, if the curve is collinear at some points with a secant, as is, say, a straight line, right, there's the secant, um, then it can be weakly concave. So a straight line is weakly concave, but also weakly convex. A convex function, in contrast, concave, convex increasing function has a secant above the curve at all points there. Um, and again, that's for a strictly, concave, strictly convex function has the line above the curve at all points. A weakly convex function can have the line sometimes collinear with the curve itself. Now, we introduce that in the context of um, calculus, two reasons. One, because you can associate concave and convex with derivatives, second derivatives. So recall that if the second derivative was um, less than zero everywhere, then it was a concave function everywhere, globally concave function. And if the second derivative was greater than zero, so less than or equal to, um, greater than or equal to zero everywhere, it's a globally convex function. And the second reason we introduced it there was because it came at the beginning of a section on optimization in one dimension. And the connection here was that a concave function, right, if you find a critical point on a concave function, and a critical point here was a point at which the first derivative was zero, then if it's concave around that point, so the curve is above the uh, secant, then this is going to be a local maximum. So if you have a concave function, um, if it's locally concave around the critical point, you have a local maximum. If it's locally convex around the critical point, like this for instance, you have a local minimum. There you go. So that is, um, in a nutshell, why we used this stuff in the previous um, set part of the class in part two. We're going to use it for the exact same purposes here. Um, all we're going to do is transfer the definitions we use there to equivalent definitions we use here for the case of um, a um, multivariable um, function, a function of more than one variable. Um, one thing before I reach these pictures and start using um, algebra to note is that if you look at the derivative of the function at this point here, it's more steeply sloped than the secant is between those two points. Here, the derivative of the function at this first point here, x1, is less steeply sloped than the secant is. So we're going to use that in some of our definitions of concave and convex in one second. Okay. So a concave function is one in which, again, the curve is above the secant. Now let's call this point down here x1. And this is one dimension, but there's an easy multidimensional analog. Um, if you call the definition, our, our analytic definition, our sort of um, algebraic definition of this thing, of a concave function before, was one in which the function evaluated at any point between x1 and x2. Now, what's any point between x1 and x2? Well, it's any point that's a linear combination of x1 and x2. So if I make lambda between 0 and 1, then the point lambda x1 plus 1 minus lambda x2 is any point that's a linear combination of x1 and x2, so it's any point between x1 and x2. And we know that the evaluation of, the, of that point on the function is always greater than anything on the secant line. So we do that. What's on the secant line? Well, the secant is a linear combination of the point f of x1 and the point f of x2. A linear combination is lambda and 1 minus lambda. And there you go. And that's the definition of a concave function in one dimension. What about a molar one dimension? Well, these are not vectors. 
There you go. That's it. <laughs> same exact idea, same, same um, notation, same everything. You just make the arguments into vectors. There's no difference. Now, it's a lot harder to visualize this thing. Um, well, I shouldn't say a lot harder. In two dimensions, it's not so much harder. You can sort of visualize a um, surface, like, say, the top of a mountain um, that's always going down. Then any plane, right, it's going to be that, that, that connects points in some circle, some level set on the, um, on the mountain. So it's going to be below the actual top of the mountain. So that's some way to visualize this in two dimensions. Um, in three or more, it's, it's hard to do. But that's a concave function in, um, in two dimensions. Now, I said before, remember that the um, rate of change of the function over here is greater at this point than the secant is at that point. So another way of doing this is to discuss um, in that context. So let's see. So the gradient of the function right, evaluated at point x1, recall, is the, the vector points in the direction of greatest increase. The secant, however, points in the direction of x2 minus x1, right? The vector between the vector pointing from x1 to x2 is x2 minus x1. So if we dot the gradient with that vector, we get the direction of greatest change of the function in the direct, we get the sort of rate of change of the function in the direction of the secant. If this is greater than or equal to x2 minus x1, so the rate of change on the secant itself, right? Then you also have a concave function for the same reasons, because you start off steep, more steeply sloped than you end up. So the, the rate of the rate of increase in the function is decreasing. These are all concave functions. A last definition of a concave function is in terms of the um, Hessian. Now recall that we said that the, that the derivative of a concave function was going to be um, less than zero. Because right? the idea was that um, you're um, decreasing, you're increasing less, so for a concave function, you start off increasing quickly and you increase less and less quickly which means the rate of increase of the first derivative is decreasing, which means the second derivative is negative. Should we put this in equal to time? Um, because of that, you have a second, negative second derivative. Well, there's an equivalent definition for more than one dimension. We call from the previous module that the Hessian computed lots of different second derivatives. The trick is to figure out a way to transmit this matrix of second derivatives into some nice thing like less than or equal to zero. The way we do that is we say the Hessian H is negative semi-definite If you forget what that means, please go back to the previous part of the class where we discussed linear algebra and introduced the concept of positive and negative definiteness and semi-definiteness. Um, we're going to see how to use that in practice in the next lecture because the primary reason for doing this again, um, besides connecting it to the deriv second derivative, is to do optimization. And we're going to find that, again, if the... Um, we call it if you have a concave function like this and it has a critical point in it, right? Then the derivative at the critical point is zero. And again, you have, um, if it's above this, then this is going to be a local maximum. So a concave function, lo locally concave functions produce local maxima. Um, local maxima. And that was the connection we did before again. So here, a Hessian that's negative semi definite is going to produce um, local maximum in a multidimensional optimization. We're going to see how that works in practice in the next lecture. So if you can't remember what negative semi-definite is, I'm not going to take time now to, work, to go through it again because we do, we're going to see examples of it in practice in the next lecture in detail when we discuss multidimensional optimization. But there's it. That's concave. There's a whole bunch of different definitions for concave. Now I could write this whole thing again for convex, but why bother? I'll just make a little picture. 
convex function, which on the previous slide looks like that. So the, the secant's above that. So if we look at, so this is equation one and equation two and effectively equation three, definition one, two, and three for a concave. Then in one, you flip the sign. Then in two, for convex, you flip the sign. And in three, you have positive instead of negative. So it's positive semi definite. All the same ideas. And here a convex, a locally convex function that has a critical point here would have a local minimum. Okay. And that's mostly it for convex and concave. And again, the major use of this is for maximization. We will cover one more minor issue that appears sometimes, particularly in economics related topics. One second. In any kind of formal theory application, you have to make assumptions um, to specify your model. And in general, the weaker assumptions you make, the better the model is, in the sense that your model is more able to apply to a broader set of circumstances, because all assumptions you make in models constrain the range of applicability of your model. Oftentimes, in game theory in particular, you are trying to maximize some utility function, and so you make assumptions on the shape of the function. In particular, you assume that your utility functions are, or you know, your best response functions are globally concave. Um, what it does is, is ensure you have some kind of maximum so you can maximize your best response functions or your utility functions. So, however, um, it turns out that in many applications, there are weaker assumptions that also get you the same result of a maximum, and that is an assumption called quasi-concave. Quasi-concave. This is not, now, so it's better in the sense that it um, is a weaker assumption than concavity. Um, a concave function is also quasi-concave, but a quasi-concave function is not necessarily concave. So quasi-concave is a weaker assumption, so you sometimes see the use of quasi-concave functions in your game theory courses. It's not necessarily common, but it's there, so we can very quickly go through and show you what this means. A quasi-concave function is one in which the linear combination, so the function evaluated at any linear combination of points. So this is the same as before we had. And as before, is greater than or equal to the other side. The difference here now is the other side is a little weaker. It's going to be greater than or equal to the minimum of the function evaluated at the two endpoints. So instead of being greater than everything on the line, it's just greater than the minimum of the two endpoints. So that's quasi-concave. Um, and that's sometimes assumed, again, in game theory, when you want to have a weaker assumption to get you a maximum. There's also quasi-convex, which I believe is used much less commonly in game theory, but it's the same thing, but you flip this one and call it maximum. That's it. Um, that covers uh, quasi-concave and quasi-convex, and we this is the end of the lecture. Um, well, the module and the lecture. So we're now done going through this sort of fundamentals of multivariable calculus. Again, just to remind you, unlike previous parts of the course, this is very directed at the stuff. This part of the class is very directed at the stuff you most need to know in your pra in everyday practice of political science and social sciences in general. Um, it does not cover every part of multivariable calculus. In fact, we're skipping large, lots of stuff involving um, volumes and services and also geometric interpretations and curls and, and divergences and all sorts of funky stuff, right? Um, the kind of stuff that you would see in, say, a physics, in a class designed to engineering physics. Um, you'd see a lot more stuff involving gradients and curl, I mean, grad curls and divergences and all sorts of stuff like that that come up when you're trying to deal with structures in three-dimensional space. Here, though, um, our focus is different. So we're going to end up our discussion of multivariable calculus and move on in the next module to a much more practically oriented, sorry, the next lecture, a much more practically oriented um, discussion of optimization in more than one dimension, which is the primary use we're going to make of this, um, these mathematics. Thank you very much.